Good morning and welcome. You are joining us for Foundations of Gender Inclusive Work, Dimensions of Gender. My name is Dana Jarzinka. I'm a training coordinator with Caltrin. I'm your host this morning. Our presenter is Carla Pena. Carla is the manager of professional, de professional development at Gender Spectrum. She is a queer non-binary non writer, educator, and activist. Her work has been focused on LGBTQ plus rights and inclusive education, as well as community organizing. And in their role at Gender Spectrum, they help families and professionals create safe and equitable environments for transgender, non-binary, and gender expansive youth and establish conditions that honor and celebrate the gender diversity of all young people. Carla, I'm going to turn it over to you this morning. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Hi, folks. Good morning. It's nice to see everybody's faces. Um, I am calling in from Richmond, right? So East Bay of Northern California, also uh, right up the original land of the Ohlone people. I just want to acknowledge that. And if y'all folks are curious about the particular land that you are on, I would suggest, recommend checking out native-land.ca um, and you just put in where you're at currently and that'll tell you um, whose land we are occupying. So there you go in the chat. Um, as Dana said, my name is Carla. My pronouns are they and she. Um, both are fine with me. And so I'm going to pull up the slide deck here and y'all give me a thumbs up and say, okay, if everything looks clear to you. Okay, it should say creating a gender inclusive world. Okay, awesome. For it's all good. children and youth. So that's our mission at Gender Spectrum, right? So we do a lot of work with schools, agency, organ agencies, organizations working with children and youth. And of course, right, as a result, we're working a lot with families and um, rather professionals who work with children, youth, and families. So what we're going to be talking about today for this, for this first uh, portion of our training is the dimensions of, of gender. And I'll go into that a little bit. So we're going to frame the work a little bit. We'll go into that framework to help us make sure we're all on the same page about what the concept and experience of gender is that we all have, right? And that framework that we use is called the dimensions of gender. Then we'll talk about congruence and dysphoria, and that's the health impacts piece of this work and why creating gender inclusive spaces is so important and how really it's tied to the health and well-being of the, the youth that we're working with. And then we'll have some time for discussion and Q&A, right? Part of that uh, format will be breakout groups for y'all to make some meaning together. And then we'll get back together and debrief and make sure we have time to answer some of your specific questions if we've not uh, been able to answer them throughout the content portion of this training. And then the next time together uh, will be part two, which is perspective to practice, right? Now we understand gender, we're on the same page about what we're talking about. And we have that language. Now, how do we implement it, right? What are the best practices in terms of creating and maintaining gender inclusive spaces, right? In the work that we do. Okay, so you should have gotten, I believe Dana mentioned already, this tracking guide. So if you have it in front of you, fantastic. If you don't, it's not a deal breaker, but it will help kind of track your understanding, right? As we unpack some of these bigger um, ideas and themes for you, right? It's just to help you move along with the content. And again, if you don't have it in front of you, it's, it's, that's totally fine as well. Okay, so as we get started, right? I understand that the concepts and language are new for many folks, right? So if you find yourself being challenged by this, right? This is out of left field for you in some respect, that's totally fine, right? Wherever you are in your gender literacy journey is valid, right? Because we all start from some point. Um, quick housekeeping tip that just occurred to me that I didn't mention before, I apologize, is um, I'm working with one monitor today Right, so when I am in presenter mode, it may be a little difficult to toggle to the chat right away. I don't want to discourage you from asking questions in the chat, though. Please do. When there's a moment um, in this content, right, delivery, I'll pause, take a look at your 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 questions, and then, of course, as I had mentioned, we're going to have time for Q and A and discussion, and I'll be sure if I haven't addressed your questions, then that we will uh, we'll be able to do so in that portion 
And if you have a question that feels pretty pressing and you feel like I need this answered or I need some clarity around this now because it might prevent me from following along, right? If it's a, something that I've just unpacked and you need a little bit of clarity, I'm totally fine with folks just unmuting themselves and saying, hey, Carla, right, get my attention and ask your question that way, right? I want folks to be as engaged as possible in ways that feel comfortable and get the information that you need if anything that is unpacked here and that is discussed here is unclear for you. Please um, feel free to do that, okay? So yes, a few thoughts as we begin, right? Understand that folks are in different points in their journey in terms of gender literacy, all of it is valid. It's also fine if you find yourself struggling, right? Many of us, is, as I will talk about, the primary model of, of gender and the way we understand it is this two category system, right? Men and women, right? So if these perspectives and this framework is new to you and you find yourself maybe resistant or finding it challenging, that's fine. My only ask is that keep an open mind as we talk about that talk about gender and discuss what that experience is like um, together, okay? So keeping that in mind, I want y'all to, let's get some awareness, right? Where are we coming into this conversation from, right? In terms of whatever our preconceptions might be, right? So keeping that in mind, I want y'all to take a look at this magazine cover. How do you react, right? It says, what's wrong with a girl who wears a baseball uniform? Right. Do you have any reaction coming up for you? It's not for, you don't have to share this in the chat. This is just for your own inventory. Okay. Now let's take a look at this magazine cover. It says, what's wrong with a boy who wears a dress? How do you react to this magazine cover? Right. Is there a difference? Some overlap? Maybe you don't react at all. Right. So however you react, if you have one. That's just information for you in terms of where you're coming into this conversation from, okay? And then one of the tenets that we uh, hold pretty um, importantly here at Gender Spectrum is that this work that we do to create and maintain and help folks maintain gender inclusive spaces, we understand that gender is about all kids, right? It's about all young people. Yes, all, all folks, but our focus is specifically on children and youth and it impacts all children, right? Not just trans and gender diverse kiddos who of course, right, are most marginalized and as a result, more vulnerable to harm, but really gender impacts all children. That impact just happens to look different for different folks. <laughs> My sister cut her hair short and she dyed it and she wears a lot of bow ties. And when I was out, my friend who was kind of mean sometimes said, ooh, you're wearing a bow tie and you got your hair dyed and it's short. And that, I think, hurt her feelings. Did you say anything to your friend? I said, that is wrong. Don't judge my sister like that. That's called stereotyping. Growing up, I see like a lot of people wearing different types of colors. And I thought like, oh, if he can wear this and I can wear that. Cause there's one day where me and my dad were in the car and some guy walked by, he had like orange hair and orange jeans and orange shirt. And he had on these bright orange shoes. And I was like, oh, he can do that. And then at first I thought I was like, that's crazy. And then my dad is like, oh, that's tight. And I looked at him and I thought to myself, I was like, what is he thinking? So then over the years, like my, well, my favorite color has been purple. And I told my dad, I was like, I want some purple skinny jeans. He was like, are you crazy? And I was like, well, you seen that guy and he had the orange skinny jeans. He's like, okay, we'll see. So he got me the jeans. And then before school started, he got me the shirt and I made the hat. Well, at first when I, I put the jeans on, I was kind of afraid what people were gonna say about him, but I just went with it. And then it kind of actually like, once I started like wearing them, it kind of felt normal. So that's kind of, it doesn't bother me when people say like, what are you wearing? It doesn't really bother me. It's like, I'm wearing what I want to wear. What's the hardest part about growing up for boys? Hiding the pain. Yeah. Not being able to express yourself. Kind of makes you feel trapped almost, because it's like you have nowhere to go. 
I have sons who don't want to open up to me. Why would you do the, I'm fine, it's okay? It's easier. Why is it easier? You're, you're, you're hurting inside. You're succeeding as a, as a guy. You are doing the right thing. We were taught at a really young age, don't cry, have no fear. You're like, okay, if I get through this, people will go, wow, that guy's really strong. He's tough. I'm always with my friend. He just she looked at me, started crying. And I, I really had no idea what to do because I've never had anybody, any guy at least, express his just emotions towards me. He just said, I think I just need a hug. And we, I hugged him. And afterwards, we both looked at each other and we were like, we're never going to say anything to anyone. When you cry, does it make you feel like a failure? Oh, there's that, that's that sense of sitting there going, why am I crying? I shouldn't be crying about this. Because it's normal. I understand that it is normal, but it is not normal. The same <laughs> <laughs> the best way I can put it. <laughs> and they all laugh because they know exactly what I'm talking about. It is normal, but it isn't normal. It is human, but it is not man. It is human, but it is not man, right? I often, I've heard this quote so many times. And to me, that's the, that's the crux here. That's what we're talking about, right? You would think to be human, right? And to be a man, they're synonymous. They're one and the same, right? And so we're seeing here that oftentimes, right? Gender pressures, stereotypes, roles, expectations, assumptions, oftentimes divorce us from our full humanity. So we saw from these few clips here, right? That children and youth of all ages, different backgrounds are accounting for gender in many, many ways, right? And some of that is the pressure to show up a certain way, right? Based on these expectations and roles that have been put forth for us to follow, right? So when we say that gender is about all kids, so we see here it is about all kids. They're all impacted by it, right? We also want to keep in mind that gender changes across time and culture. You're probably noticing this maybe in some of the work that you're doing with some of the youth, right? That younger generations, right, younger kids maybe have more expansive understandings of gender. And I'll unpack that for us in this next couple of slides, right? So we have a poll here, a Fusion Millennial poll of um, youth, well, not really youth, depending where they fall, right, of millennials, this generation from about, since 18 to 34, more likely now, because this is a couple years old, 22 maybe to about 38 or so, right? About half of the folks in this group who are identified, right, who are millennials, this generation, see gender as a spectrum, right? Some people falling outside of conventional categories of man and woman, right? Half. It's a big number, right? And we see also from this, this generation of millennials that 12% of millennials identify as transgender or otherwise gender diverse. Now we see from this next slide, right, that Gen Z, the generation that comes after millennials, so youth who are in their late teens, early 20s, about 35% of Gen Z personally know someone who uses gender neutral pronouns. An example of that is they, them, compared to 12% of boomers a few generations back, right? We also know that this generation, about three quarters, are more accepting of non-traditional gender identities than they were one year ago. I'm willing to bet that the generation after Gen Z, generation, uh, I think it's alpha, right? probably most of the, the kiddos that you're working with, have even more of an expansive understanding of gender and how folks show up in the world, right? So we see here that gender, the way we talk about it, right? Socially speaking, folks' understandings of gender with younger generations, they have more room for folks to be outside of those conventional categories of man and woman. Now, we also want to keep in mind that there are gender traditions across the globe that account for gender in different ways, right? Again, right, outside of just man and woman, there are other traditions that account for gender in a more expansive, nuanced way. So we'll see that in the next couple of clips. This is, oops, sorry about that. This is Geronimo from the Native American Navajo community in New Mexico. Shea Francis Geronimo Louie. I am Chiricahua Apache born for Diné. I identify as a two-spirit individual. 
Geronimo identifies as one of the four sacred and ancient gender identities from his culture. We have masculine, 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 feminine, 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 masculine. Masculine, feminine is something that I gravitate towards both spiritually, mentally, physically, and emotionally. The word for masculine, feminine is nakle, someone who is male-bodied, has a feminine nature, or who also takes on the roles of a woman and man. 8,000 miles away in India's capital, Delhi, gender has been more than just male and female for centuries. Hi. Namaste, I am Leher, I am 23 and uh, I was not born in a female body. In 2014, the Supreme Court recognized a third gender. I was assigned a uh, sex male at birth and I changed my gender medically. However, uh, I'm not what in the Western terminologies you would call a trans woman. In India, we're considered third gender or the sacred gender that has the power to bless or to cause. They're regarded as highly sacred and respectable. Over in Australia, transgender people have had different names among Aboriginal communities. Kai identifies as a brother boy. So a brother boy is a person that's been born female, but has a male spirit or masculine spirit. Our understanding of being is so much more than a scientific definition of what is XX chromosome or XY chromosome. As someone that was born a woman and done women's stuff and then transitioning into a man, you know, it's um, quite difficult at times to find your place as a person within my culture. And I think, yeah, I'm still on that journey. Right, so those are just a couple of examples of different cultural traditions and understandings of gender. And see this map here, right? Those, are, those aren't outliers. There's many, many different uh, gender traditions around the world. Whether or not we're familiar with it, right? They exist. And uh, so just keep that in mind as we, as we move forward, right? The concepts of gender that we're familiar with, it's not necessarily a given across the, the globe for many cultures. So we're gonna go into the dimensions of gender, which is a framework that we use to talk about and conceptualize, right, gender. But before we get into that, I want y'all to think of a time when you felt fully present, you felt grounded, seen, and understood, right? What did that feel like? Using the chat, you can use one word or phrase to, to characterize what that period in your life felt like feel free to do so, right? You felt fully present, grounded, seen and understood by the folks around you and your community. What was that like? Refreshing, centered, mm -hmm. loved, peaceful, <laughs> powerful, right? Safe, fulfilled. I mean, we're seeing the theme here. It's all pretty good right? When things, when folks see us, we feel safe, we feel grounded, we feel free, a lot of opportunity here to just be, right? So hold on to that feeling. That feeling that we're talking about is called congruence. So when we're talking about gender and gender health, we're talking about congruence, the sense of agreement or harmony or alignment with respect to our gender, gender experience and gender identity. So, there's three essential ideas with regard to the dimensions of gender, right? This framework that's going to help us conceptualize what this experience of gender is that we all have. The first is there's three dimensions that, that um, inform that experience of gender. And within those three dimensions, when things are as they should be, we feel in alignment with our gender identity and the experiences, of, the experience of ourselves. It's called congruence. And those three dimensions are body, identity, and social. And I'm going to go into each, each of those dimensions shortly. And another way to say congruence, right, alignment, uh, harmony is health. Because essentially, when we're talking about gender, this is about the health and well-being of folks. The second of the essential ideas is that each one of these um, dimensions or aspects of gender 
is a spectrum, right? No two bodies are going to be exactly the same, even if it's two cisgender women, for example, right? Or two cisgender men. No two bodies are exactly the same. Bodies are on a spectrum. And the same is true for identity. No two identities are going to be, a, be the same, right? How you define yourself as a man might be different to somebody else's definition of what it means to be a man. And then lastly, social. Our social experience is a part of the gender experience because we don't live in a bubble. We're not in a vacuum, right? Folks react to us. We react to folks. It's in flux. So the social experience of gender, that dimension, is also a spectrum. And then lastly, there's a difference between gender and sexual orientation. Maybe this seems obvious, maybe not. Um, many folks conflate the two and use them interchangeably, myself included. Once upon a time, I'd use them like just swap them out. But gender really is about me, right? About the self, what I know to be true about me. Sexual orientation is about me in relationship to someone else, right? And it's really important we make that distinction, especially when we're working with children and youth, so that when we're supporting them, we're supporting them in the right ways, right? Are we talking about gender and authenticity? Are we talking about sexual orientation developmentally? You're probably not talking about sexual orientation with a little kid, right? And so it's important that we make those distinctions, okay? And then I also wanna mention that the dimensions of gender as a framework, is consistent with a number of professional organizations, right? They're endorsed by these professional organizations, right? We didn't come up with this. Um, there's science, there's research to back up that each one, right, this framework. And I also wanna mention that it should be enough when folks come to us, when youth come to us and say, hey, this is the truth about myself, that we take them at face value even if their experience doesn't make the most sense to us, if their experience is outside of how we experience gender, ultimately in service of youth, right, and support of families, their truth is what matters to be able to support them, right? And so both things can be true. It can be true that yes, there's research and science behind this. And when someone says, this is my truth, that we accept them, okay? All right, so getting into nitty gritty, the first dimension is the body. And for many folks, this is where gender begins and ends, right? Our anatomy, the physical self. And think about when the child is born, right? How is that child's sex assigned? We look at the child's body. If the child has a penis, we say, oh, based on the, on the fact that you have a penis, we're going to assign the sex of male. Assume the gender of boy. If the child has a vulva, we assign the sex female, and then we assume that the gender is girl. And then for many folks, that's the end of the story, right? This is known as the gender binary. When your gender is presumed based on your anatomy and your sex assignment, either you're assigned sex female and you're a girl, or you're assigned sex is male and you're a boy. This is the model of gender that most, if not all of us on this call, and across the globe are most familiar with, right? Well, I'm gonna unpack for y'all here. I want you to stay with me that this gender model is actually incomplete, right? I'm not gonna say that it's outdated, it's wrong. It's incomplete though, because again, research that we're seeing, things are more of a spectrum than we initially thought. And folks' has lived experience, they're letting us, right? Folks are letting us know that this gender binary is leaving some folks out. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So let's think about a gender reveal party, right? How invested as a society, right, socially we are to these traditions and rituals of equating sex assignment to gender, right? We got the pink blowout smoke and the blue pistols on a cake if it's a boy and et cetera, et cetera, right? When you stop and you think about this unborn child or even once they're earth side, what do we know about them? just their anatomy, right? What we can visually see. So more than a gender reveal party, it's more apt to say it's a gender reveal party because as we'll see, there's a lot more that, that informs biological sex and gender, right? So really a gender reveal party, you don't know the gender of this kiddo. What you do know though is their anatomy and then we're making all sorts of assumptions um, based on that, right? So we're also seeing that through research, sex is also binary. It isn't binary. It's also a spectrum, rather, right? So we're used to those typical assignments of female and male, 
but it's actually not that simple. There's a lot more that goes into, right, and determines someone's sex and their gender. Even the biological categories of male and female are blurred. We know today that not just the X and Y chromosomes, but at least 12 other chromosomes across the human genome govern sex differentiation, and at least 30 genes are involved in sex development. Right, so that's a lot going on with regard to biological sex. That it's not enough, right, to look at someone and say, I know the whole story, when there's so many things that the naked eye cannot see that informs somebody's sex, right? Their chromosomes, hormones, genes, et cetera, right? And so we also see that outside of the perhaps more common, more typical assignations of female and male based on what we see of, of the, the physical body, there are folks who are born who are intersex, right? Who have traits, both female, male, right? Um, that exists, right? And so we see this third possibility, which shows us again that this binary model, the model that says there's only one or two ways to be and it's based on your body, actually doesn't even work because there are folks who are born naturally who are intersex, right? This third possibility. And so in this next clip, we're gonna define what intersex actually means. Raise your hands if you have testes. <laughs> I'm Pigeon. I'm Alice. I'm Emily. I'm Cypher. And we are Intersexy. Intersex describes a person who doesn't fit the typical definition of male or female. I have XY chromosomes, but typical female genitalia. I'm a girl who has testes and XY chromosomes. I identify as a queer, gender nonconforming intersex person. I identify as a black intersex man. Intersex is not new. It's been around since the beginning of human existence. I mean, there's probably even intersex dinosaurs, if you think about it. I mean, it sounds a little funny, but I think it actually probably was true, right? Intersex individuals occur naturally across most species. And we see Nemo there, not to be, you know, dismissive or facetious here, but because Nemo's a clownfish, right? And Nemo, right, clownfish actually change sex, right? Um, the individual clownfish does, right? And so we see here that intersex in terms of the, the diversity around sex and gender is actually really normal um, that, and, and quite common, even though that might not be what's most familiar to us. And if you remember from the video, it says two in every 100 births are folks who are born intersex. That's the same percentage of folks who have red hair. It's that common. Right? Whether or not you know someone is intersex, it's that common. And we see from that clip too, just by looking at folks, there's no way that we know the whole story, right? There's no, could you look at some of those folks who raised their hands, right? Who presented maybe very typically feminine, right? Many, most, most of us might guess, oh, right, this person is a woman, right? And I believe they identify as a woman, right? Did you know though, right, that they have testes and XY chromosomes, which we erroneously pair with just being male, right? So there's, we're seeing here that the body is not enough to know someone's sex, let alone their gender, right? It's more complicated than that. And it's fine if it's more complicated. What we're saying though, is that the gender binary is a model that we've all been taught. It's not great because we're leaving people out inevitably, okay? Now, the second dimension is the identity. That's your internal truth, right? No one can tell you about what's, what's true for you. You know who you are, all right, in, in your innermost truth. And this is also the, the label that you use to communicate that truth to others. So with respect to the gender binary, uh, gender identity works in two ways, right? Based on your sex assignment. You are either a woman or a man or a girl or a boy, right? Depending on your age. But we know just from the world around us and maybe with many of the youth that you're working, that folks actually identify a, on a spectrum in lots of different ways, right? Not just, there are not just men and women, right? There are folks who identify their gender in many different ways, okay? So I want y'all to keep this in mind. This is just for you to have in your back pocket. You don't have to answer it out loud or in the chat. Want you to consider, want you to think about when you realized what your own gender was, 
How did you know? Okay. Well, according to American Academy of Pediatrics, gender identity is established pretty early on across the board, right? So by age four, most children have a stable sense of their gender identity, right? Regardless if they are cisgender, transgender, gender diverse, however they identify, by four, most of us, we have, an, we have a pretty good idea of who we are, right? And that's not to say that we have the language necessarily to articulate it, but children show us in many, many ways the truth about themselves with respect to gender. So let's take a look at these next couple of graphs. This is a survey done on uh, transgender adults, and they were asked to look back, right, at what age they were when they realized, when they knew that they were transgender. All right, and we see a small group of folks new in their 20s, still more between the ages of 16 and 20s when they realized they were transgender, a little bit more between the ages 11 and 15, still more six to 10 years old, and the majority of folks, right, by age five knew that they were transgender, right? Again, consistent with what the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics is telling us about gender identity being established pretty early on. Now let's take a look at the age of disclosure, right? At what age did these trans um, individuals disclose or share this information about their truth, about their identity with somebody else? I'm just gonna cut straight to the point. The largest point, the largest number here of folks' is age of disclosure is between the ages of 16 and 20, right? Huge gap from age of realization to the age of uh, when you tell someone, right? So a lot of Many trans adults knew that they were transgender by the age of five, but waited a decade plus till they were 16 to 20, right, to share that truth about themselves with someone else. That begs the question, why, right? Well, we got a couple of things that can help us answer that, right? Think about how we've all been taught that the gender binary is the only, the only way to be with respect to gender, right? That's our model. We've all been indoctrinated by this, and this is, we're operating from this framework, right? So whenever is a cisgender child questioned about their gender, gender identity? So cisgender means your sex assignment is in alignment with your gender identity. So if you're assigned female, for example, and you know yourself to be a girl, you would say you're cisgender, right? So when there's a little girl, assigned sex female, knows herself to be a girl, everyone around this child assumes that, that, that she's a girl, do we ever say, hey, are you sure? Maybe it's a phase. You're too young to know. We don't ever say that, right? However, when there is a young person, when there's a child who tells us that their experience is actually not what we assume and what we expect, right? A transgender child, non-binary, otherwise gender diverse, we say those things, right? It's a phase, they're too young to know. I don't wanna, I don't wanna talk about this with them because they're gonna get confused, et cetera. So these young people, right? The children that we're working with in our families of origin, um, in, in, in our day-to-day -day work, right? They get the message loud and clear, right? From these fears, the media that we consume, the world around us that if you are not cisgender, right? If, we are, if you are not who we all assume you are based on your sex assignment, it's a phase, something's wrong. And we teach folks not to talk about it, right? Because it's seen as abnormal, quote unquote, right? So I want y'all to pay attention to this next clip, pay attention to the parents in this scene and the educator. Nina came into my life six years after Serena was born and Dev was a beautiful, healthy, peaceful baby boy. You know, we had this, this perfect kid. He's, you know, he's handsome, he's tall, but it wasn't easy. There was something just not always clicking. The day Dev could walk, the walk was feminine. The day Dev could talk, it was really feminine. The way he smiled in pictures, the way he posed. I thought maybe, maybe Dev will be just an effeminate male. Maybe Dev will, will be a gay male. Maybe who knows what, or maybe just a passing fad. He would pick up dolls and we would take them and hide them. Just snatch them out of his hands. I didn't understand what was happening to my boy. Deb would, would talk to us and say, you know, I think God made a mistake. I mean, and we would do what every parent did and said, no, God doesn't make mistakes. I think he gave up on telling us 
and he started to tell his kindergarten teacher. She called us in for a conference. And she then pulled out a sheet of paper and said, um, I think you need to see this paper. And this, it was a sheet of paper, and I still have it. It was a picture of an elephant trapped in a cage. And then it said, um, the elephant is very sad. She is stuck, and she is sad because nobody will listen. I felt like I was hit by a car because it just hit me that my child is a girl. So we came home and we told the older two kids, I want you guys to observe. We're going to talk to Deb about this picture. Deb, tell me about this picture of Dumbo. And he said, Dad, that's not Dumbo. That's, that's somebody else. Deb, who is it? He said, oh, her name is Beautiful. And I said, who is Beautiful? She wouldn't look at me. And I said, look at me. Who is Beautiful? And she said, she was so scared of so much fear in her eyes. She said, Beautiful is me. I'm beautiful. <laughs> well, it took me about 30 seconds to take that in and that I just wrapped my arms around her and I said, you will never have to be Dev again, ever. So I don't think for a minute that those parents are bad parents. In fact, I think it's a pretty safe assumption that the parents and families and caregivers that you work with, they care about the kids in their care. They care about their children, right? That's a pretty safe bet. What I see the issue as being is a framework, right? A framing issue. They're operating from the framework that most of us operate from, right? And that have been taught the gender binary, right? without understanding, without having the knowledge that gender is actually a spectrum. So when their kid comes to them and, um, right, assuming the, 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 sex, uh, the sex assigned at birth is male, they're assuming their child's a boy. And Davina is not a boy. Davina knows that she's, she's not a boy, right? And so it was communicating to them and they start to pick up cues about her gender, right? And so what do they say? God doesn't make mistakes. Maybe it's a passing fad, right? Maybe Dev will be an effeminate male. Maybe he'll be gay, right? And this is what I was talking about, making sure we make that distinction between sexual orientation and gender so that we could support the young people properly in the ways that they need to be supported, right? So it's a framing issue. They don't have the knowledge, right, that gender is actually a spectrum. Many of us don't. This is why it's so important that we do this gender literacy work, right? And we see the, the, the kindergarten teacher, right? The educator here. And regardless of your specific roles, y'all are quite literally protective agents, right? And you, you're here to serve and support families and children. And you see here that this educator provides that bridge that's missing, right? Between framing and, and, and that issue of understanding. And it's like, you need to like to take a look at this, right? And pretty poignantly, Dev creates this picture. It doesn't get clearer than that, right? That she feels stuck and nobody's listening to her, right? And so we need to dig deeper here. But y'all as um, in, in your respective roles are, are the people who will be able to bridge that gap of understanding between parents, caregivers and their children, right? And we understand here too, right? That language is really powerful. Listening to folks and their truth is also really important, which leads us into this next portion, which is the language of gender identity, because it's helpful for y'all um, in whatever your, your professional capacity to be familiar with this language, right? So that you can, you can bridge those gaps of understanding for some of your, your families and caregivers. So there's a couple of ways that we can define gender identity. This is probably what most of us are familiar with. It's a binary identity, right? Binary meaning two, the concept that a person's gender is either boy, man, girl, or woman, right? Most of us are familiar with this. Cisgender is a binary identity, like I talked about, a gender identity that aligns with the assigned sex at birth. It basically means it aligns with um, if we see that your assigned sex is female because you have a vulva, you know yourself to be a girl, it's a, in alignment with the guess, basically, because we're guessing, right? It's in alignment with that. So that's called cisgender. There's transgender, gender identity that is 
So it's opposite, I would say different, right? Um, from the assigned sex at birth. You might say that Davina is transgender in that Davina was assigned sex male at birth. Davina knows that Davina is a girl, right? And there's not what most folks around her are assuming based on that sex assignment, right? So trans comes from the Latin meaning across from, cis means on the same side. That helps you kind of um, differentiate the two. So this is one way we can talk about identity in a really binary way, which we're hoping to move away from, right? Because remember, gender and sex is on a spectrum, not a binary. The other way is non-binary identities, right? Basically that the concept is of a person's gender is not solely boy, man, or girl, woman, right? It can be a combination. It can be completely outside of that. And these are a couple of examples of gender identity terms that folks use to describe their gender experience, right? And yeah, it's helpful that we have a good handle, general understanding of some of these terms, right? But ultimately what matters is how the person using it is defining that particular word to describe their experience, right? So it doesn't matter what, how, what I say polygender means if I'm not using polygender. If a youth I'm talking to work, working with comes to me and says I'm polygender, right? Great, thank you for telling me. What does that mean for you, right? Of course, you wanna have some baseline understanding, but ultimately it may mean different things to different people, right? And so take, for example, transgender, gender identity that doesn't match the assigned sex, basically, right? And so it's not that we're operating from a binary in this, in this case of using transgender, it simply means I am not who you think I am based on my assigned sex. Could also be used as an umbrella term, right? All this to say, and the point I wanna get across here is that we wanna, we should want to get, let go of having the right answers all the time, right? Language continually evolves when people tell us who they are, right? Yeah, we wanna have a general understanding, but what does that identity term mean for you, right? So it's about having the right questions and staying open to what someone tells us is their truth. Now, I have mentioned this in the beginning, right? That there are different gender traditions across the globe. I just wanna show y'all again, right? A number of cultures that have an account or rather account for non-binary identities. So this isn't new in terms of the history of the world, right? This has been around non-binary identities, identities that fall outside of just men and women is, something that's been around for thousands of years for millions of people. Whether or not we are aware of it, you know, if it's new for you, that's fine. But in terms of the history of the world, it's not new, right? Okay, and that leads us to the third dimension. So the third dimension is the social, right? The ways we show our gender, and that's also known as gender expression, which most of us are probably familiar with. It's also reactions we get from others, right? That's part of the social experience of being on the planet, that we're interacting with folks. Folks react to us and respond to us, and that's part of the social experience of gender. So with respect to the gender binary is that incomplete model that most of us are used to. There's only two ways to express your gender, right? And this is probably going to sound familiar, right? If you're a woman or if you're assumed to be a woman, folks will say you have to act femininely, dress femininely, carry yourself femininely. Q, whatever that means in your specific context, right? Same is true if you're a man or assumed to be a man, right? The expectation around your gender expression is all things masculine, right? Dress mass in a masculine way, have masculine interests, whatever that means, right? In your particular context. And that's the binary. But some of the aspects of gender that we take for granted are actually socially constructed. And socially constructed is just a fancy way of saying made up, right? just like money, for example, or race, for example, right? I'm not trying to belittle it. What I'm saying is that when enough people come into agreement about something, it becomes a fundamental truth, whether or not it is a truth, right? And that's not to say that if it's socially constructed, that there aren't real material consequences when we fall out of line for what's expected of us based on, or based on these assumptions that folks make around race, around gender, around class, et cetera, et cetera, right? But we just happen to be talking about gender today. So 
how, how do I know that this is made up? How do we know, right, collectively speaking, that a lot of these aspects that we take for granted are made up? Well, we get messages all the time about how to be and how to perform gender in one or two ways, right? Um, and our, our youth are getting these messages, right? Man up, right? That's not ladylike, et cetera. We're getting messages about how to perform gender in very, very specific ways. Sometimes it's insidious. Sometimes it's not so in your face. So I want y'all to consider this ad, right? And using the chat, feel free to just know any observations you make about what the message here with respect to gender might be. What are some things you observe? There's a pink one for girls. Mm -hmm. Yep, the, the, the pink one's also the smallest. It's in the corner. And it's kind of it's kind of rinky dinky when you compare it to the one that's front and center, right? Boys equal science, discovery and knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. So y'all see it, right? Sometimes it really is pretty blatant, the messages around gender that we're getting, right? And so if we get it, our children are getting it. Whether or not they're cognizant of it, right? They're internalizing it, right? A lot of this stuff we are asleep to. It doesn't mean that we're not internalizing it. So we see here that the most scientific looking telescope that's front and center is the most powerful one. It's the most expensive. It's also being used by who most of us, right, contextually, socially speaking, would assign, right, boy. And the one that is the cheapest, not, not that great, right, in the corner is pink. And we assume, right, and, and make the association of pink with girls, right, and blue with boys. So... We see here that this, the, the message here, science is for boys. And if you happen to like it and you're a girl, it's a hobby. It's not serious, right? And so that's the messages that we get. And we get all sorts of messages about this. And some of them, this is one of them, but some of them are also, I would say, yes, problematic, but also dangerous. Let's take, for example, this one. Consider your man card reissued. What are we saying about what it means to be a man? To be violent? To be aggressive? To be into guns? Right? And so a lot of these messages that we get about performing gender and showing up in a certain way based on all these made up rules, right, can be really damaging and really dangerous. And so when we talk about gender being about all kids, it is about all kids, because look at how they're being impacted, right? How we're all being impacted, this script that we're being taught right, about what it means to be a man or a woman. And so really what we've kind of unpacked here about gender expression, they're stereotypes, right? It's more appropriate to say that they're stereotypes, these, these expectations based on your assumed gender, right? So if you're a girl, that a lot of these expectations around gender expression are stereotypes and the same for men and boys. But again, like we're, we keep coming back to gender expressions a spectrum, right? There's, there are folks who identify as women who aren't the most feminine, right? Whatever feminine means in your particular context, right? It falls on a spectrum. And so we see here, right, that some of these things that we, we take for granted as just being the truth are made up. And an example of that are the, uh, are the colors pink and blue. The generally accepted rule is pink for the boys and blue for the girls. The reason is that pink, being a more decided and stronger color, is more suitable for the boy, while blue, which is more delicate and dainty, is prettier for the girl. Trade Publication, Earnshaw's Infant Department, 1918. You see that I would say most of us on this call, not maybe not all, right? We have made the association because we have been taught, right? We've been conditioned to see colors in a very gendered way that we associate the color pink with girls and the color blue with boys. And we see from this trade publication, right? This ad that's more than a hundred years ago, it actually used to be flipped, right? And so that's what I mean when I say that it's made up. It's made up. And to the comment in the chat, which, you know, go ahead, make your comments. I totally, I want y'all to, to really engage with the material is you're right, right? It doesn't say that the pink, the pink toy didn't say girl, it's not labeled. Right, and that's what I'm talking about, how insidious it is. We make the association because we've been conditioned 
to associate pink with girls. So I don't have to tell you girl, because I've taught you, right? I've showed you, and I say you, generally speaking, right? That girl equals pink, pink equals girl, right? So I don't have to say it front and center. But we see here, right, from this trade publication, it was the flip. And the reason behind this is what was, was from 1918, right? Children's clothes, clothing, right? Um, it used to be all white, right? And the reason behind making them colored was so that folks, when they had children, they had boys, girls, right? Children of different sexes would then now be forced to go buy something else, even though they had a white night, or I don't know, whatever you call it, the onesie or whatever the case may be, a dress for the, right, for the child. Now, socially speaking, now there's, there's been this turn. Now things are being separated by, by gender. And so I have, now I have a boy. I can't recycle the, the, the white one. So I'm gonna go out and buy blue stuff and pink stuff, right? And so we see that link here is capitalism. It's about money. It's not about actual folks' gender, right? We're gendering things. But when you think about it, colors don't have gender. We gender it. Telescopes don't have gender, right? Su subjects, right? Um, occupations, right? Science is for everybody. We gender it. That's where the problem comes. When we're gendering things that don't have gender, the only thing that has gender, people, right? Which leads me into this next point, patterns, right? So if you think about the magazine cover and, and your reactions to it, if you had any reactions to it, in my experience with folks that I've worked with, myself included, again, when I've, when I've seen this, right, most folks don't bat an eye with a girl in a baseball or softball uniform, right? It fits a pattern that most of us are used to, right? Girls play sports now. Maybe not football, but baseball. Yeah, we're kind of used to that. In the 50s, might be a, a little bit different. 40s, might have been different. 2021, a girl in a softball uniform? Okay, sure. However, a boy in a dress with long hair, does that fit a pattern that most of us are used to? Most of the boys in our lives want to wear dresses, like wearing dresses, maybe not, right? And I'm talking again, majority speaking, from a pattern that we've observed. And we observe these patterns for a specific reason, and I'll go into that a little bit, right? So most of us might have not bad an eye with the girl, but with the boy might have taken pause for something. So I just want to say that noticing these patterns, right, and these reactions that we have, they're not inherently wrong to notice a pattern, right? Because that's how the brain makes sense of the world. We notice patterns, right? The issue becomes when we turn patterns into rules, right? Now we say that based on a pattern that I've observed, that most of the boys around me don't wear dresses or even want to wear dresses, that now means no boys wear dresses and we make it a rule. And then what happens to the folks who fall outside of the pattern, right? The, the, the young boys who do want to wear a dress and wear their hair long. What happens to them, right? Well, rules get enforced. And when they get enforced, people get policed, right? And part of that policing of gender, because you don't fit a pattern, is harassment, is bullying. So our job, right? Our job in working with youth and families and caregivers, right? is to make that distinction between a pattern and a rule, right? And check ourselves and help our, our, our parents and caregivers and even some of the children we're working with to make that distinction between patterns and rules and not punish folks when they fall outside of a pattern that I made and the, and the assumptions that I've tied to that, right? And to normalize that not everyone is going to fit a pattern that we're accustomed to, okay? And then, the pressure, how, how great is this pressure? How intense is this pressure to perform gender in a certain way, right? One of two ways that we've been taught. I wanna give you all an example of Wilt Chamberlain. Professional basketball player, great of, I'd say one of the greatest on his time. Only player ever to score hundred points in a single game. It's gonna be clear in a minute why I'm bringing this up. His career free throws, however, were not great. Half the time he would make it, half the time he wouldn't. So one of the most effective ways to slow him down was to foul him, right? So if he had, he had to shoot a foul, right? He'd have to shoot a free throw. That was a great way to slow him down because half the time he's not even gonna make it, right? However, in this 100 point game, his free throws were the best they had ever been, better than his career free throws, right? 28 out of 32. So what did he do different 
in this game. He shot granny style, right, which is underhanded, right? And so the most successful game that he's had, 100 points, most successful in terms of free throws is because he shot underhanded. And you would think high stakes environment like professional basketball, right? Your name is on the line. Your team's reputation's on the line. A lot of money is on the line, right? I'm just going to keep doing what works for me to ensure that I make that basket, right? And so in his case, granny style. But after this game, he didn't do it anymore. Why? He's quoted with saying, I felt silly, like a sissy shooting underhanded. I just couldn't do it, right? So he took the hit in his, in his career, right? In his free throw ability, he took the hit rather than be seen, right? Maybe as not masculine enough, not man enough. So he succumbed to the pressure to perform masculinity in a certain way, right? And this is a grown adult professional athlete. So I just want y'all to think for a moment how great that pressure to conform must feel like for the young people in your care, right? It's a lot of pressure. How did we get here? Where does this come from, right? This pressure to perform gender in one of two ways and that intensity. Well, history matters. It's a result of European colonialism, right? Which was the violent imposition of language, cultural values, religious practices. And virtually every culture that I can think of across the globe has been colonized in one way or another, right? If you think about here in what is now known, the United, uh, now known as the United States, right? Was, indi was and is indigenous, right? Indigenous Native, Native Americans, right? Who were here first. And now we have settlers who came and said, you know, this is the language you're going to use. These are our cultural values. And one of those systems, right, that were imposed was the gender binary. Because if you recall from that video of Geronimo from the Navajo Nation, many Native American cultures actually had more expansive understandings of gender. But through colonization, right, many of those traditions, um, not only in Native American cultures, but as we saw across the globe, were purposefully, purposefully erased and disappear, right? This is a result of colonization. Colonization is the reason that most of us on this call are familiar with the gender binary as the primary, if not only, way of understanding gender. And for many communities, the history of gender fluidity was lost with colonialism. Sister girls and brother boys, history is difficult to document because of the effect of colonization. There's been a lot of shame and stigma. Pre-colonialism time, Gender roles were actually widely accepted amongst my people and our tribe. Um, these individuals who were called two-spirit were widely respected when colonialism started to happen. A lot of our people died and were murdered, and so a lot of the teachings and understandings of these people were lost. Forced assimilation, religious conversion all contributed to the idea that two-spirit individuals were bad people and they needed to go away. I face a lot of discrimination. It hurts my feelings. Leher also believes that colonization has meant there's less acceptance of gender diversity in India. Colonization uh, is what has corrupted the mindsets of uh, Indian folks that today are maybe transphobic or homophobic. Right? So we see that the gender binary is no accident. It is no accident that most of us, again, if not all of us on this call, are familiar with this and this alone, right? And think that there's only men and women when we've seen, right, for thousands of years and millions of people, there are other ways that folks described and understood gender, right? So again, I just want to drive home the point that it's not anyone's fault necessarily that that is what we believe to be the truth, but that's why it's so important that we know the history of the gender binary so that we can start to unlearn it and make more room for folks, right? And to make more room for folks so that we can show up for them and support them and support ourselves, right? Because we also have skin in the game, right? Gender also, genders, gender stereotypes, pressures to conform also affect 
those of us who are cisgender as well, right? And to live up to this impossible standard of womanhood or manhood, right? We're all affected by it. And so when we think back to the magazine covers, right? The difference in our reactions, again, is also tied to one of those imports of colonization, which is patriarchy, right? Or socially speaking, we value masculinity in this culture. We devalue femininity. So a girl who is moving towards something that socially speaking, we, we deem masculine like sports and, and, and athletics, it's no problem, right? But a boy who quote, forfeits his masculinity in favor of something more, more so, socially seen as feminine is giving up this masculinity for something that we don't value societally, right? As a result of patriarchy. And that's why it's important that we know the history and how these systems operate. Because a lot of the time we're asleep to this. We're not even aware why we have certain reactions to how people present themselves, right? And, and if, especially if they fall out of patterns that we're used to, patterns that we've been taught to notice, right? A certain way. And so this leads us to the last part of this section which is congruence and dysphoria. Like, what does this all mean in terms of health and well-being of young people, right? It's important that we establish that understanding of gender, but now how does this show up in terms of the health of, of young people? So we talked about congruence, right? Meaning that alignment across all dimensions, body identity and social, right? When you feel grounded in yourself with respect to your gender. And that harmony across three dimensions is for a particular person. So what it takes for me Carla to feel congruent is going to be different for Dana, right? We're different people. So across those three dimensions, it's going to be different for different people. And ultimately that congruence is about health, right? Health and well-being. And we all seek this harmony, right? We're all on a path to seek that congruence. It just happens to be that the path looks different for you than it does for me and the next person and the next person. Right, so now what happens if something is not quite in alignment in one or all three of the dimensions? Dysphoria, right? Dysphoria is described as a state of feeling very unhappy, uneasy, or dissatisfied. And this is with respect to gender, because that's what we're talking about. And many of us experience dysphoria, right? It can be, however, maybe more apparent and more talked about with respect to gender diverse young people, right? Trans and gender diverse kiddos, because they very obviously um, oftentimes fall out of these two boxes that have been imposed on us, right? And so yes, that, that dissatisfaction that might come about in one or all three of the dimensions can be because of identity, right? And the, and the struggle with trying to navigate the world the way it is right? And a big part of dysphoria too is not about the trans identity or non-binary or gender diverse identity itself, but how folks react to trans and gender diverse identity, right? And I want to make that distinction really clear, right? And dysphoria can be something more mild, right? To something more severe. Melissa sits in the back of the classroom, afraid to speak up. She pulls awkwardly at her extra loose khaki cargo pants. She doesn't want the boys to notice her. James finds himself in the back of the classroom. His baseball cap casts a shadow on his pimple-stained forehead. A wide shirt hangs on his broad shoulders. But no one ever noticed him. Melissa, the teacher asks. And she says nothing because she is not here. And Melissa has never been here because Melissa is just some abstract jumble of syllables that doesn't fit her position. She's not what she seems. She doesn't want to have to explain to her mother for the 232nd time why she doesn't want to wear a dress to prom. Doesn't paint her face. It's because the whole body's painted on. Melissa, Melissa. James doesn't want to have to explain where he came from. Because with, with the, the exception, exception of Melissa, Melissa he has been deemed an abstract reality by everyone. everyone. All he wishes for is to get to wear a tuxedo to prom. 
And Melissa has been tugging at breasts steadily growing for three years now. Been using duct tape to press them down and mold them more into pecs. She just wishes that people would understand that at birth, her genitals didn't know which way to grow. Mad at God who couldn't relay the message directly to her hormones that they should produce more testosterone. The only person who understands her is James. And they've been playmates since the age of four, around the time girls notice boys. And boys notice girls. See, James's family wanted daughters instead of sons. And Melissa was always like that male beetle that everyone called a ladybug. Melissa, Melissa, where is she? Sometimes she wishes she could rip the skin off her back. At every moment of every day, she feels lost in the flesh of a stranger. Melissa! And she stands to her feet, wanting to say, I'm here, and I've been here since I was born. So quit asking me if I'm a him or a her. Because when you combine the two pronouns, you get H-I-R, here. And God combined the two genders and put me in this body transgendered. I'm here, so quit talking about me like I'm not here. James falls back into Melissa's skin, and the two comfort each other in their syncopated heartbeats, waiting for the day when Melissa can finally scrub off this made-up genetic makeup. When the teacher asks for James, and he can say, I'm here. So that's a very specific um, experience of severe dysphoria. And I just want to mention here, there's a couple of things we hear, right? We hear social dysphoria, right? Basically, everyone around me is not believing who I am, right? And so then we see that that's very much folks' reactions to transness, not about the trans identity itself, right? We also hear too, though, right? Um, struggling, uh, genitals didn't know which way to grow, right? And the experience for some folks, again, not across the board where they feel maybe they're in the wrong body, right? But not every trans and gender diverse person feels that they're in the wrong body. That is a valid experience, right? But I wanna make space here again, right? We have a tendency to put everything into a binary, including transness, right? Oh, you're in the wrong body, that's what it is. Okay, yes, that's valid. For some people, that's the experience. And for other folks, that's not the case. But dysphoria is something we also all experience, right? Well, think about the last time that you didn't live up to maybe what was expected of you in terms of femininity because you're a woman or masculinity because you're a man and something doesn't quite add up, right? Because we're all put up against these ideals that don't make room for folks, right? That don't make room for folks. And so dysphoria um, can have some really severe consequences specifically though, right? And particularly, I wanna center trans and gender diverse young people who again, are most at risk of harm, right? And I see a couple of, a couple of answers in the chat about um, characterizing what this must feel like, right? Some of the negative health impacts, right? The dangers of dysphoria, and we wanna pay particular attention to our trans and gender diverse kiddos, right? Are the following, because it's serious. Low self-esteem, promiscuity, withdrawal and isolation, depression, anxiety, self-harm, eating disorder, substance abuse, suicidality. That's a lot. So when we talk about this being about the health and well-being of young people, quite literally, it's about the health and well-being of young people, right? When we're talking about gender-inclusive spaces, that's what this is about, right? This isn't about politics, even though oftentimes transness is politicized, right? This is about helping folks to feel whole and authentic because the world around us has showed us you can only be a person with respect to gender in one or two ways, right? And so we want to be cognizant of this and want to help young people move towards congruence and away from dysphoria. Unfortunately, we have a number of measures that we, we know that we can take to help young people move away from that because we want young people, no matter what their gender identity is, to thrive to do well, to be safe, to feel safe, seen. Some of those measures, and I'm gonna go pretty quickly here so that we have the next 15 minutes um, to talk, right? So in the social dimension, let kids try on different clothes, different gender presentations, play around with makeup, hairstyles, whatever feels affirming to them, right? Because we've been taught this is the only way you can be, but there are folks as we see, right, who fall outside of those expectations, which are too rigid anyway, really, when we stop and think about it. Right? Maybe it means having them experiment with different sports and hobbies, artistic expression. In the identity realm, it means if a kid comes to you and says, these are my pronouns, that we use their pronouns, even if they're not the pronouns that we assumed 
that we should use for them, right? Um, chosen name, right? Maybe there was a name that you were given at birth and it doesn't feel affirming to you, right? So my name is Carla. Maybe Carla doesn't fit me and I go by another name, right? Maybe I go by a boat more masculine sounding name, whatever the case may be. It may be different for different folks, right? But part of the support and affirmation for folks to move them into, into congruence is to support them by using the right pronoun and using their chosen name, if that's the case for them. I'm going to skip this in the interest of time, right? All this to say that folks might... Um, Coming, young people might be coming to you and have different iterations of the identity term that works for them. And it's not about them not knowing themselves. It's about finding clarity, right? Young people need access to language and information like y'all are getting today, right? In terms of gender and understanding it as a spectrum and developmentally it's appropriate for them to think about what feels like home and they'll land on it, right? They know themselves, but they need time often, right? To find that clarity around the language to describe what that experience is. And then lastly, in the body dimension, right? You heard the duct tape be, being used to mold breasts into pecs or something like that in the spoken word, right? That's an example of bind, binding, right? Where you bind the breast tissue down to achieve a flatter silhouette, right? And there's blockers, surgical congruence measures. I also wanna mention here, not every trans and gender diverse person is going to elect surgery the same way not every cisgender person is going to have breast implants or penile implants, right? We want to be very cognizant that it's about the individual, what makes sense for them, what uh, to move towards greater congruence. And then to recap, body, identity, and social, those dimensions all together is what equals the experience of gender, not to be confused with sexual orientation, which is one's physical and emotional attraction to others, right? How many times do we put this lens of sex when it has nothing to do with sex and we're talking about somebody's gender. We heard it in the Davina clip, right? Well, maybe he's going to be a gay male, right? Maybe, maybe not, right? But we do know Davina's gender expression, right? And so we want to make sure that we're not making those assumptions and we make the distinction really clear so that we can support the young people, right? The youth um, appropriately. So that was a lot. Um, all this to say, if women and men work for you, fantastic. But we have to understand, though, those aren't the other only other ways that folks experience their gender and want to make more room for folks. So I'm going to give y'all about seven minutes or so to, to get into your breakout groups. And I want you to consider what are some things that stood out for you? Uh, what questions do you still have? And then we'll get back together and hopefully um, have some time to answer. There should be time, too, for the second half for further discussion. So I would really encourage folks to, to do both, right? We rarely do this as a standalone. Part one and part two really come together in terms of integrating this information. So I'll see y'all in about seven minutes and then we'll come back to the main group. So I got a list of questions that were submitted in advance. I took a quick, a quick look at them. A lot of them um, will be addressed in the second half because the second half is about the implementation piece, right? We really want to make sure that folks have a deep understanding of gender as much as is possible, right? Because this takes time to shift your perspective, um, right? And a lot of the questions that came up are the practical stuff, right? When this shows up with a family or a young person that I'm working with, what do I do, right? Pronouns, um, shifting how I think, how I engage, inclusive language, all that good stuff. So I just want to uh, assure y'all, if we don't get to get into all of that today in the next five minutes that we have, there is opportunity with the second portion. So I really um, encourage folks to, to prioritize that as much as it's possible. But with that being said, I'd love to hear what came up in breakout groups. Uh, what questions that do you still have? Feel free to unmute yourself and just ask if you have a question that feels vulnerable, you can message me privately and I will not name uh, the person who said it. I'll just answer the question. I don't have a question, I just have a comment. I just wanted to say um, thank you for putting on this presentation and for everyone who's involved in it. I think what I'm taking away from, um, from this presentation for me as most significant is the um, turning patterns into rules. I think that that kind of goes across the board in identity when it comes to addressing things that have to do with identity and stuff. 
um, and the intersection of identities and trying to break down the explanation of the difference between a construct and um, you know what what is. So thank you for that piece. I really, really appreciate the whole presentation and the whole though. For sure. Thank you. Thanks for your time and attention and for um, for that feedback. Right. I think that I am uh, not new to this work, but I'm always still learning too. So having heard that perspective too was a shift for me. Right. We don't we don't realize how we operate almost on autopilot. Right. And now we've turned patterns into rules and not to shame anybody because that's how the brain operates. But that's why it's so important that we like make those distinctions so we can catch ourselves. Right. And show up for folks and show up for ourselves, honestly. Right. Thank you for that. Yeah, a lot of a lot of um, comments in the chat. Thank you. Um, any any other any questions? And again, right, if you have a question that feels really vulnerable, private, privately chat me. That's totally fine. I will not say your name. Um, I know that sometimes there are questions that feel, right, if we're coming from a good place, I'm going to assume good intentions, even if sometimes it comes off a certain way, right? We're learning. So I really just want to offer you all that opportunity. And again, feel free to unmute yourself and just ask a question. Carla, I have a question. Yeah. So. Um, in our Family Resource Center, we don't work with children specifically. We work with parents and parent education. And the biggest challenge that I am acknowledging that we have is parental resistance yeah. and acceptance mm -hmm. and the forcing to conform and trying to withhold my own judgments and trying to figure out a way to continue that conversation where they feel like as a parent, we're validating their concerns or their own struggles with it, but then also prioritizing the safety of their child. And so it's it's really hard, and I, I don't know the answer. Yeah, but you know, unfortunately, fortunately, a lot of this, there's no hard and fast answer. A lot of this is that deep work, building rapport with parents and caregivers, right? Establish that first and a lot of deep listening. I'll give you some um, examples, tips that um, we'll be going into, um, but I, I imagine, right, I realize that many folks have the same question. We can make an assumption, right? Most parents, caregivers, if not all, deeply care about their kiddos, right? And so that roadblock that comes up, the resistance, the withholding, the forcing to, to conform, right? Where is it coming from? And in order to find out what that lock is, right? So that you can, you know, find the key to unlock it, you have to have a conversation. And a lot of that is listening, right? And I think oftentimes we have a tendency to like, I wanna fix, I wanna come in and I know that what you're doing is actually harmful. You may not know that and swoop it in that way. And in that way, many times folks, their defenses come up, they start to withdraw and then there's no getting to them, right? So to prevent that and having a conversation with parents, right? Tell me more about what your concern is. What is your fear? And sometimes there are themes that come up, right? Maybe it's just fear. I fear for my kid's safety, right? And so making a distinction between discomfort and safety, right, is what your kid do. If your kid is not being able to access a restroom or shared space that's in alignment with their gender identity, right, not their sex assignment, but their gender identity, you don't want to allow it because you're afraid something's going to be happening to them in that space, for example. Well, what is your kid likely doing? holding it, not going during the day, right? So they're already not safe, right? And so having those kinds of questions to tease out, what's the fear? Sometimes it's about, I don't know enough about this, right? And so you need to build their knowledge. Of course, right, you have to build that rapport first, but give them opportunities to build their understandings around gender, right? Um, giving, pointing them to resources to learn about gender and gender identity. That could be the roadblock. Maybe there are folks in my community, there's no one in my community rather, who has a trans kid that they know of, right? Mm -hmm. And so finding those exemplars, right? In your community, oftentimes, right? Cult, that cultural component is important. I happen to be Puerto Rican and Cuban. And when I came out to my parents, it was like, whoa, what? We don't do that, right? And now mm -hmm. that we've turned a page years later, my parents now, my mother goes out of her way to be like, oh, I know this Puerto Rican celebrity or Cuban, whatever, and they're trans or 
you're right, making that connection. Oftentimes folks don't see themselves reflected and think this is an outside issue when really gender diversity is a human issue, it's all of us, right? And so sometimes it's, a, it's an issue of finding the exemplars, connecting them to other families, right? You know, another Latinx family that has a trans kiddo, making that connection, right? So really what you wanna do at the core is what's that lock and then provide the key. And I think a good uh, starting place always though is building that gender literacy and then the other stuff comes along, right? The exemplars, uh, that safety piece, um, and centering the child, right? There's, there's research that shows forcing of gender conformity has long-term negative effects. Share that, lean on my experience as a professional, lean on that. In my experience, this is the outcome, right? So that they can make informed parental decisions. And, and I do agree with you. I think the relational piece is foundational mm -hmm. because otherwise they're not going to come back. So I appreciate this has been fantastic. So thank you. Sure. Thank you. I appreciate that. I want, I want to be mindful of the time. It is 1132. I can hang out for a couple of minutes, but I, I imagine y'all have lots on your plate, lots to do. I'm going to put my email in the chat. Ask me questions. Please use it. And then, as I said, there's part two to this. And if you can, if you can um, sit in on it, I would really encourage folks to do both parts, right? Because you want to move away from theory and into practice. Sorry, Dana. Thank you so much. Just a minute. Carla? Yes. Carla, quick question. Um, the certificates for these for this class will be emailed uh, to our, our personal emails? That is, is a Dana question. Uh, okay. That is me. Um, we are actually going to be dropping that in the chat uh, along with the evaluation. I'm going to drop it right now. So you will see a survey link in the chat. When you complete the survey, there'll be a certificate at the end. I'll also put that survey in the follow-up email that'll come out within the next two days. Um, and same thing, complete the survey, the certificate will be at the end. Uh, we will have the recording of this training. We're going to put that in a, the follow-up email to you all. It won't be initially posted on our website as we do with many of our recordings because we are going to repeat this training again in May. Uh, so if you have a colleague or if you're in a leadership position and you think your whole team should see this, by all means, keep an eye out for the mailing list and Keltron Connect. Make sure they sign up for the May 18th training. And then on May 25th, the part two that Carla mentioned, the gender practices in action is really the implementation piece of this series. So do watch out for that and sign up for that as well, since this was such a fantastic training this morning. Um, again, recording, resources, survey link, all in the next two days. And I will drop that survey link in the chat again now. We do definitely read all of these um, and action your feedback where we can. Uh, we're a young program. We started this year and have evolved over the course of the year based on your feedback. So we really appreciate the time you take to fill out these surveys. If anybody has any questions or comments for Caltrans staff, um, feel free to message us or to send us an email and I will put the info at email address in the chat now. That includes if you have a great idea for a training, you'd like to talk to us about your organization's needs, uh, we are more than happy to talk to you. And again, thank you so much, Carla, for joining us today. It was an absolutely amazing training. We're really looking forward to having you back in May. And uh, as Carla noted, if anybody has any questions that they'd like to hang out for a bit, uh, we'll both be here for a little while. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Caltrans. For your time and attention and for the work that you do day in and day out, right? Like I'm here talking, but you're out in the field, so to speak. So I appreciate that. Hey, Carla, will the, will the implementation, the action, does that kind of speak to like cross-culturally um, making resources and language like more accessible. I mean, I was born and raised in Seattle, grew up in San Francisco. Now I'm like working at a public high school in North Carolina. So I'm like, I've kind of been all over, but I'm finding kind of the, the, the feedback that I'm getting when I've done trainings all over the, this state as well is like the language is so esoteric, right? The language is very like particular. It's very like white, um, you know, like, how do we talk about these things to a Chinese family where English is a second 
language and they're like that we, that doesn't happen like first of all I, you know this particular family might be like not only does like mental health like we don't really view it in the same way but now like gender like that's not what we conceive of so um and a lot of the resources are like those those handouts brochures but i'm like they're definitely like way more than a third grade reading level right they don't speak to like a literacy of our family so um is that going to be i know it was a lot yeah. just throughout yet but is that going to be kind of in yeah, there we somewhere talk, we talk about a couple of resources um one of them being a family acceptance project which does just that right we're centering uh lgbtq young people from I, I mean, I personally don't really like the term culturally diverse because then that means diverse to who, right? That means that we're centering whiteness, but folks of all backgrounds, but particularly those who are marginalized, right? And so family acceptance, acceptance projects, we lean pretty heavily on in terms of um, resources in different languages, cultural context. So I would do a quick Google search of Family Acceptance Project and bookmark bookmark um, their website just um, as, a, as a good place to start, right? Because as you said, there's a lot of things to take into consideration. Um, there is no one size fits all. Gender as well as any other identity, that it, it, that whole, it's sitting within a particular intersection, right? There are different identities that are at play. So, but as in terms of resource for those particular contexts, I would try um, take a look at Family Acceptance Project. Awesome, thank you. Of course. And then, sorry, again, like, so the, the, um, the statistic on intersex folks, so that was one in 200, and I always read, like, one in 2,000. I guess it depends on who is included in that number. And I'm just going back to like Ann Foster Sterling's like Sex in the Body is where I got the one in 2000 stat off the top of my head and I know it's probably older information, but I didn't know if that included like Turner syndrome and androgen and sensitivity syndrome and hypospedias. Like, I don't know if it included all those yeah. or it's just- I mean, to be honest with you, that's a, probably a little bit more specific than I am familiar with, right? Like I've, I've, I've actually only ever seen it two in every 100 live births, right? What are those actual considerations to determine whether or not this person is intersex, right? Some of the syndromes that you've named. I'm not exactly sure. Generally speaking though, in what I have read, that's been a pretty consistent um, percentage that I've seen, close to 2%. I think it was like 1.7. So okay. two in, in, in every 100 is um, what, I'm, what I've, I've mostly seen. Awesome, thank you. Thanks everyone. Uh, again, we will be sending out information about the two May trainings. So do watch your email and particularly our Caltrain and Connect newsletter. And I hope that many of you will join us again tomorrow for Latinx Youth Development with Dr. Gustavo Carlo. Thank you so much everyone for joining us today. <laughs>